So these are my disclosures and my academic and teaching agreement with Medarty, so also with Exatech. Um, as you probably uh, will see um, now, the famous movie by Sergio Leone, the good, the bad, and the ugly. But these are the the three scenarios that I would like to to show you that they are all, all part of my daily practice. Uh, first of all, the the good one is the the high energy uh, tibial pylon fractures. He has a few concepts, theoret theoretical concept before. Remember that involves the weight bearing articular surface of the distal tibia. They are not so common injuries, fortunately. And um, they are secondary to two main mechanisms, but the one that I, I want to, to point out is the high energy axial compression injuries that um, are secondary to, um, most of the time to road traffic accidents or fall from height. Okay. Nowadays, I think the CT scan is, is mandatory, uh, especially if you are thinking about in the stage procedure, a two, two stage procedure, and the CT scan must be performed after the, the X fix. So sometimes uh, when, you, when you perform the CT scan, it, it changes your mind about the surgical approach. And although there's a lot of uh, uh, variance or variability, there are three uh, constant fragments in, in every, in every pylon fracture, the tibial pylon fracture. This is the medial fragment, number one, the anterior lateral and the posterior lateral. There, there are, um, most of the time, there are uh, um, constant fragments. What's the meaning of a stage procedure? Um, I think it's the, the two stage procedure is recommending in the high energy close uh, uh, tibial pylon fractures. You know, we follow the, the principles of a span, then a scan, and finally plan. We use a simple delta frame, as you can see in this photo, with the configuration two or three proximal pins in the tibia, a calcaneal transfixation pin, and um, also it's recommended a pin in the first metatarsal bone to avoid the, the quinus deformity. But I think the main concept is to, to have a, a, a enough room, a room for the plate fixation. So try to avoid to put the pins in the distal tibia so the pins should be placed well proximal to the estimated location of the proximal end of the plate. Some cases of my center, we use a, a lot of, uh, of times uh, also the, the vacuum therapy for the, for the healing of the wounds, but you see the delta frame, the delta frame configuration. Although it's not so common, but sometimes we, we have uh, very tough cases that the, that the, as the one that I saw in this slide with a lot of blister and swelling of the surrounding periarticular soft tissue that are difficult to manage. Remember that the definite fixation after the external fixation is recommended at about uh, two weeks uh, of the initial injury. And although there's no definite clinical signs to decide the timing, uh, I think most of us use the wrinkle signs or the placing of the soft tissue wrinkles. But another clinical sign that is also very useful is the epithelization of the blisters. I think the AO principles are still valid, but must be revisited. We have to, to revisit the AO principles. Remember, the restoration of the fibular length is crucial, but uh, we have to keep in mind that some percutaneous or minimally invasive techniques are also uh, 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 described in the literature and uh, but they are very useful especially in high energy cases. The anatomic reduction of the articular surface is desirable. It's our belief that this desirable and must be done whenever feasible, although there's uh, some kind of controversy with this topic. Due to the high energy, the metaphysical bone defect is very common and we really prefer to use bone autograph from the iliac crest when possible. And finally, the medial column fixation is very important for us through the anterolateral plate or sometimes through an independent uh, approach, we use a small plate or even one or two cortical screws to correct any virus deformity, which is also very common as a sequela in this uh, very 
complicated uh, lesions. There's a lot of approaches, as you can see in this slide, but we use most of the time the anterolateral open, the posterolateral open, and sometimes the anterior medial with a minimal invasive approach. The choice of approach depends, uh, although no one is suitable for all types, it depends on the soft tissue condition, the articular comminution, the displacement pattern, the metaphysical, diaphysical component, and sometimes we have to use several approaches. Try not to use more than three approaches open. You can use up to four or five if one of them is uh, minimal invasive. And also uh, remember that the surgeons, so we have to be, we should be comfortable with the various approaches described. And for me, uh, the most difficult part uh, maybe is uh, to control the posterior fragment, the big posterior fragments through the anterior approach. So if we have a, a big uh, or displaced uh, posterior fragment like we do in the trimalleolar fractures, ankle fractures, we have to go first posterior and then anterior. It's also very important to, to keep in mind that the concept of the three columns that has been described in, the, in, in a lot of uh, articles that the one I, I saw you in the slide. Remember, this is uh, images, pictures from the cadaver lab from Medartis using the Medartis anatomical face. This is the anterolateral approach, remember, to preserve and to protect the superficial peroneal nerve. This is the anatomic, uh, there's a lot of plates in the market, but this is the one by Medartis anatomical uh, plate, anterolateral plate, which is very, very low profile and very strong, and I think is coming handy in every case. You see also uh, a photo of the cadaver lab. The posterolateral approach also is very common in our, in our daily practice, uh, as well as in the three malleolar fractures. And I strongly recommend you the floppy lateral position that has been described. This is the position of the patient. You can uh, get uh, very easily access to the posterior part of the tibia, and then from the same uh, position, to the anterior lateral and finally anterior medial. This is also a picture, a cadaver lab on the posterior approach, using also by Medartis the, the anatomical plates, locking plates with a T and L shape, which is all which are also very useful. Some tips, some tricks for the for the tibial pillow, be soft tissue friendly, it's very important, less invasive approaches, a state procedure that I, I mentioned before, MIPO techniques or external femoral destructure are very helpful. Remember three open procedures, no more than three are recommended. Usually uh, we follow the, the principles of open posterior lateral and open anterior lateral and then medial minimally invasive. What about the, the fibula, the distal fibula A or B and the space or not comminuted or any type of C fractures, we try to use a percutaneous fixation with the screws, with long screws, or uh, sometimes percutaneous plating. Uh, my preferred treatment for high energy injuries, uh, if we have a displaced posterior framing, is to go from back to front. It's very, it's very uh, common to have a very big posterior fragment, and uh, we use a posterior lateral approach first, fixation of the posterior tube. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, later with the, in the cases then the anterior lateral approach, and finally the minimal invasive medial approach if we can. But what about the complex articular patterns? Uh, if, we, if the pattern of the fibula is simple, I do the, the fibula before the tibia. But if the fibula is comminuted or very distal, maybe it's better to do after the, the tibia. Remember the reconstruction of the joint line of the articular surface to use a, a temporary K, uh, K wires to, to fix the fragments and, and finally to close the book. Stabilize the medial framing is very important. So the concept is to, to turn a C type tibial pilum into an A type. If we have the osteoporotic fractures, it's very important not to use a, a stability, absolute stability. It's better to use the, the concept of the relative stability. But if we have, on the other hand, we, if we have normal bone, it's better to to, to, to use the concept of absolute stability with combination of locking and non-locking 
Jesus Christ. Some cases uh, from my hospital, which I think is the most important part for you. This is a no case with comminuted the central defect of the of the distal tibia, an old case, and in, in that time we didn't use uh, uh, the posterior approach. So you see, I think there's a gap here in the posterior part. And if you see, we only use two screws from the medial part, and, the, and you see here there's a collapse from the medial fragment and a virus deformity, which is not, is not good. So this is a tibial pinu with a dislocation of the joint, and these are the the, the concept that we are follow nowadays. First to fix the posterior fragment, you see the posterior lateral approach, temporary fixation with KYs, and then anterior lateral uh, approach with anterior lateral plate, and finally the, the, the fibula that you can fix the fibula percutaneous, like in this case with the plate. This is the final construct with a very nice restoration of the joint line. Another high energy uh, comminute fracture type C, we follow the stage procedure. Remember, the pins in the tibia are uh, far away, far away from the from the definite pl place for the for the tibial plate. Also, a pin in the in the calcaneus and a pin in the first uh, metatarsal bone. The CT scan after the after the X fix to to see the. The, the, the fracture pattern to plan the, the definite fixation. And this was the, our final uh, uh, result. You, you, you can see here, this is a type C fibula with intramedular fixation with a good result, anterolateral plate, posterior plate, and also uh, one screw. I think maybe it's not enough, but the result is good. Maybe nowadays I, I use a a mini plate for the medial column instead of only one one screw. Another comminute case, type three again. You see the central defect and very comminute, but even in this case, we follow the same principles. First, using the medatis plate in this case. First, the posterior fragment in this case up to four plates. Finally, anterolateral for the tibia. You can see here posterior T plate for the for the posterior fragment, medial plate, and a reconstruction plate of the fibula with a, fine, a good result. You can see here, post up at a three weeks with a good restoration of the joint line. Another comminution, you see after the X fix, look at the comminution. This is our delta frame configuration. Sometimes we use an extra an extra to avoid the, the bed shores in the in the hill, we use this this configuration to avoid the the, the injuries due to the to the bed shores in the in the hill. So you see the CD scan with a lot of comminution, the central defect, and after the two weeks, two or three weeks, definite fixation again with a lot of of. Uh, a place a configuration for posterior approach, and you see the anterior lateral, the posterior, the medial uh, column plate fixation, and the anatomical uh, plate for the fibula. You see, even in, in this very tough case, we can nicely restore the joint line, as you can see. I, I recommend you to do, even in the, in the first cases, to do a post-op CT scan to see how good is your your, the reduction of your uh, of your joint line, because uh, in, with the X-rays you underestimate the, the quality of your of your reductions. You can see here a good restoration, even in these very tough cases. Of course, we have complication. We have had a, a lot of compli of of complication. In spite of following the the principle of a state procedure, this is a, the case that I showed you before with the with the with the four plates and with the exposure after the infection, exposure of the anterior uh, tibial tendon, exposure of the anterior lateral plate, we had to we had to to take out the the plate and to to make a flap with the help of the plastic surgeons with a good uh, final result. In conclusion, the complex injuries difficult to treat even today with uh, poor outcomes, historically poor outcomes. 
Remember that cartilage damage is very common in metaphyseal comminution and of course the soft tissue injuries. There's no unique treatment strategy for all the fractures, but remember that in high energy is recommended the stage treatment in most of, of the cases. AO principles are still valid, but you have to keep in mind the, the new uh, uh, minimal invasive techniques. Soft tissues are critical and you have to wait for the soft tissues to for the definite fixation. And remember the concept from back to front fixation with anatomical and low profile, low profile plates if you, if you can. So following with the presentation, the, the bad one, the second uh, scenario, the bad one is the osteoporotic ankle periarticular fractures. This is the case of the 83 year old woman with vascular insufficiency, previous leg uh, ulcers in the, in, the same, in the same leg. You see the condition of the, of the soft tissue, a very not good condition of the soft tissue. And we decided to, to fix the fracture in an acute setting with a retrograde TTC nail. Uh, which led us a strong fixation with a minimally invasive approach. It's a unique surgical procedure and allows, I think one of the most important things and advantage of this technique is the, that uh, it allows uh, narrow immobilization and full weight bearing in these frail, frail patients. So the concept uh, is the uh, indications of the acute TDC nailing osteoporotic ankle fractures in frail patients. Remember that these fractures are very common. They are a frequent scenario in our daily practice. Uh, and remember that we treat uh, sedentary people in their 80s or 90s with a high comorbidity, with a poor condition, as I showed you before. And also remember that conservative treatments are badly tolerated. And on the other hand, the conventional or traditional open reduction internal fixation often fails. So if you look at the literature, there's a lot of papers uh, talking about the, the predictors of adverse events that, that the one that I show you, the age more than 65 and American anesthesiology has a score more than two, body mass index more than 30, and daily activities dependence or diabetes, they are all uh, adverse uh, a condition, a precondition for the for a good result, and we have a lot of uh, of patients, or we treat a lot of patients with uh, with a lot of uh, of condition like uh, like the one I show you. So the desirable goals in the frail patient are the strong primary fixation, minimal invasive techniques, one surgical because we we really want one anesthesia, and the most important we want an early mobilization weight bearing to avoid complications. So these are our cases. We nowadays have more than 20, 20 cases, really more than 20, I think 22 cases nowadays. This is a 82 year old diabetic woman with shared two uh, close fracture, sedentary, the, he, uh, she uses the cane to walk. You see the comminution. And we decided in this case to use a long Along TTC nail up to the level of the of the knee replacement with a good uh, in this guy in this case is a femoral uh, T2 is a femoral femoral uh, uh, nail with a good result. Another case, 84 year old diabetic and rheumatoid woman with a, a treatment with corticoids and, and biological treatment. Biologic treatment. You see the bad condition of the soft tissues. And if we use no tourniquet, no tourniquet, we uh, don't address the subtalar or ankle joint because it's not a fusion, it's, it's a fixation. And you see in this case, with a good result, acute TTC nailing, post-op full with wearing, sorry, should you remove three weeks. And you see here the result. And you see this patient at six months, at six months, Walking without any problem. 
So we had this is our studio twenty patients. We studied the alignment and the functional results. Two cases with complete ankle fusion, in spite of not uh, addressing the subtalar of the of the ankle joint, we made a, a fusion, and no major complication registered in our series. We're waiting for the publication of our series. So this is not a new concept. It's been published before since 2013. I think it's a good option. Acute disinaling in osteoporotic uh, arc ankle fractures in very frail patients especially indicated in, in our opinion, in unstable patterns in patients with some kind of walking difficulty before the fracture, because you have to remember, you have to, to keep in mind that this the DDC nail avoid, uh, block the movement of the, of the ankle joint. So it's a desirable decision-making treatment and we are working in our, in our service to, to design a new algorithm, a new algorithm to for the indication of this very nice, in my opinion, treatment. And finally, uh, the ugly one, uh, if you remember the, the movie, the ugly one is the ankle or if deep infection is a very, uh, a very bad uh, to treat, a very challenging complication for the orthopedic surgeons. This is an open ankle fracture dislocation in an 81 year old woman, diabetic, bad control diabetes. You see a severe lesion. And although we, uh, we prefer an, an augmented uh, uh, open reduction and internal fixation and augmented fixation, in this case, my, my colleagues decided to, to, to fix with only one uh, tibial uh, fibular screws. Uh, they led the patient up to three weeks not with women after partial weight bearing. Uh, the catastrophe uh, be began with a, a deep infection and an acute charcot, or maybe a, a combination of, of both problems. We have read, uh, we read in the in the literature the concept of the cement arthroplastic in very frail patients with a high comorbidity in cases of ankle joint dis distraction, and we tried this. This treatment with this, uh, with our patient, we also take out the fibula, and you can see here due to severe severe infection, we made a biopsy. I received therapy with an uh, antibiotic, but um, at two point five months and after partial weight bearing, the, uh, she uh, developed again an infection, an active infection with an ulcer, and you see the X-ray with the breakage of the of the semen spacers. We propose the, the patient at this stage uh, below the amputation, but she refused the amputation. And we also look in, into the literature and the use of the antibiotic, uh, antibiotic coated nail um, uh, for fusion in infected charcot ankles. It's also being used in the in the tibia osteomyelitis, and we decided to, to, to use this treatment. We have nowadays six cases uh, with this treatment. Um, we use uh, a nail uh, coated with a cemented uh, uh, antibiotic. Then we put a silicone tube, we, we cut the, the silicone tube, as you can see here, and then we introduce the nail. This is the post op, three months follow up. And this is the, the x ray of the fusion. You can see here the fusion. This is the, the cement here at more than one year evolution. The pre op and the three week, three weeks post op. We have published this technique in our National Orthopedic Journal. The desirable goals, remember in the, in the deep infection, after or if at the eradication of the infection, ankle high foot stabilization, and the tibial talocal kind of fusion, although sometimes the fusion is not possible. Uh, I think the fusion is some kind of fiber fusion in, in most of the cases. I want to show you uh, our toughest, toughest case 
This is a 70 year old woman sedentary Parkinson's disease with a noble ankle fracture dislocation, grade three costillo. After four surgical procedures, she developed a deep infection. We use the same concept. You see the nail covered with antibiotic. And this is the six months post-op, still without a fusion, but the patient is very uh, happy, no signs, no clinical signs of infection. The biomarkers are uh, at the normal levels. And you see here the alignment is good if you compare with the other with the other limb. And you see the patient walking. Sorry. You see, remember this is a Parkinson patient. But even without using the, the crutch, as you can see here, it's, she's very happy walking without the, sorry. A 64 year old diabetic man with a pillow fracture or if deep, deep infection after more than five uh, previous surgeries, you see the stem and the spacers. You see there's no, no talus here due to severe stimulitis, no talus. You see the severe stimulitis of the talus. We decided to, to perform the same procedure. This is the intra op uh, uh, images. In this case, we have no talus. We use the tentalium spacer. You see here, maybe it would be desirable uh, anterior plate, but you know the condition of the of the soft tissues of the soft tissues were very bad. You see here twelve months evolution, and this is the condition nowadays. Healing of the ulcers, no signs of infection, although a breakage. This is the condition of the twelve months after full weight bearing. You can see right now. You see some kind of fibrous fusion here what happened in the future uh, we really don't know but so far the results is so good in a very in a very uh, complicated case and you can see here the patient walking with crutches without any can walk full weight brain with crutches or so. In conclusion, ankle or if deep infection are challenging scenario. Uh, I think this technique is our last effort to, to preserve the, the limb. It's, it's an alternative in multi-operated patients with, with refractory deep infection. I think it's, it's very good to eradicate uh, the infection, but at the same time, it, it provides uh, enough stability. Yeah, the okay. So, Next to him. Thanks. Thanks for, for your attention and, yeah, I think, and uh, wait. We I wait for your for the discussion, for your questions. Perfect. Thank you so much, Mario, for this great presentation. I think this was highly educational and we already received a couple questions. So first of all, a first question from Faisal. Uh, can we modify the surgical approach of the pillow fracture, especially for severe comminuted fractures with high chance of ankle AO to be prepared for future total ankle replacements? Yeah. Yes, of course. I think um, it's a good question. If you are thinking about in the in the uh, total ankle replacement or even in the ankle fusion maybe you i recommend you to go anterior more than anterior lateral i think it's it's better to go anterior you, you go first posterior if you have a a, a big uh, a big fragment of um, a posterior fragment and then you better go anterior you better go anterior if you are thinking about the uh, fusion but sometimes I, I do, when I, when I do uh, a replacement, I do a modification of the anterior approach. We, uh, we make some kind of anterior, anterior modified approach with a, 
S, not a straight approaches with an S. And in this in, in these cases, I think you, you can do the same approach with the highly comminuted fractures. But I think it's, it's, I'm, I agree, I totally agree. Uh, if you're thinking in, in the replacement, maybe the anterior, the, the traditional anterior approach would be better, would be better. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Next question from Jorge Alves from Mexico. When and, uh, sorry, about retrograde nailing, when and which cases would you consider implant removal to restore mobility? This is also a good question. If you look at the literature of the, of the papers uh, dealing with this technique, uh, they, have, they have published uh, um, in many cases, the removal of the of the nail, but in my opinion, our cases are very old patients, old, low demand, sedentary, sedentary patients, and I think in our surgery, in those cases, uh, we don't need to to take out to take out the the hardware, the nail, because I think one of the the most uh, important advantages of this technique is this uh, that you are uh, you only use one anesthesia one surgical procedure these are very uh, complicated patients with a lot of comorbidity so if you take out the nail you're thinking in taking out the nail is another surgical another anesthesia so i think it's not good for for the patient in my opinion and in my in, in our series in in my hospital, in my center, these are indicated for very low demand patients, and we are not uh, thinking about a new procedure. We try to avoid a new procedure. All right. Uh, then another question from Victor Valderabano. How important is vitamin D3 uh, after for post-operative treatment? It's also a good question. I think nowadays it's very important. We don't, we, we prescribe um, uh, vitamin D in almost every place. We also prescribe vitamin C because it's been described, especially in the upper limb, um, that is very useful to, to avoid the, the algal dystrophia, the SUDEC uh, syndrome. So we use uh, the, the vitamin D in every case, in every case. And sometimes if we are, um, in elective, uh, in elective uh, patients, we, uh, we uh, I think we measure the levels of the vitamin D3 before the operation because there, there are the several uh, publications that uh, talk about the, the risk of uh, delayed union or even non-union in patients without without the normal levels of, of vitamin D3. So I think it's very important. We prescribe vitamin D3 in every single patient that we operate on. Okay, thank you. Then another question from Asan Arifi. Historic amputation rate with these fractures is around 5%. What is your amputation rate? And what is your view about fixation uh, of fibula? Do you fix fibula all the time, and what are your suggestions in case of fixation? The first question, sorry, was was about, about the, the amputa rate of... amputation rate. Exactly. What is your amputation but rate? Amputation rate in in which cases? In the infected so, cases? Yeah, in... he's writing historic amputation rate with these fractures. I guess like the ugly ones, uh, the very bad one, is around five percent. What is your amputation rate? In tibial pillion fractures, in single, so. in, single, in single tibial pillion fractures, my rate of amputation is zero. I think maybe he's talking about the rate of amputation in infected uh, or maybe yes, mm -hmm. yes. It's about it's about it's le less than than five percent in our in our in our service. Less than five percent the rate of amputation. I think we have a very good result. Historically, we have used the X-fix, the external external fixation, to to treat the the infected ankle. Or if, of course, it depends of the evolution of the 
of initial treatment. You, you know if, it, if, the, if, the fract if the fracture is healed or not. It depends of, of several factors. But um, our historical, our traditional uh, treatment method uh, have been the, the ex fix antibiotic therapy and then uh, the treatment of the sequela. Some, sometimes uh, most of the patients uh, need, uh, needed a, a fusion of the, of the ankle joint. But nowadays, with the, with the TTC cement coated nailing, I think our concepts are, are changing. And I think it's a very good idea in, in selected cases, of course. And about the fixation of the fibula is a matter of, of controversy. There's a lot of controversy in the, in the literature. I think it depends. But um, in most of the cases, especially in type C and supra uh, syndesma uh, fibular fractures, I prefer to use the uh, percutaneous fixation using a 3.5 uh, large screw, long screw, very long screw, or even a K-wire. K -wire. Um, I think it's a, it's a good option. But uh, nowadays, it's a matter of controversy. I think maybe is the is the if the fracture is very comminuted or very distal, most of the actors uh, recommend you to fix after the tibia, not before. After the tibia, you fix the, the fibula if the fibula is very comminuted. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next question. Uh, what about the single stage in the first 24 hour fixation without soft tissue compromise? Do you have experience with fine wire fixators with minimal approach? Yeah, um, I think it's a good option. It's a really good option. So I think the problem with this kind of fractures is that sometimes you don't have the, the, the surgical, the sur OR, uh, the so are um, available available to do to do the the fixation of the, in an acute uh, phase. It's been described. It's been described, but I think maybe uh, in in very um, expert hands you can use the the minimal invasive in the acute phase um, in the in the first twenty four hours in this kind of fracture. But if you if you have a look of the literature in high energy. Most of the of the authors uh, prefer the stage procedure, the stage procedure, uh, uh, in order to to avoid the the complications of the of the soft tissues. Even in expert hands, you you can you can have a, a lot of complications with these very high uh, energy fractures. Mm -hmm. Then the next question from uh, Simon Knops. How often did the nailing lead to symptomatic non-union implant failure of TTC in these cases? If yeah. soft tissue would allow, would you prefer fusion? No, I no. I think it's, it's only it's also a good uh, a good question. Um, we had only two cases. We have nowadays 24, 22 cases of acute TTC nailing uh, to uh, for fixing the fractures. And we have also only two cases with symptomatic, uh, symptomatic non-union of the subtalar joint, not, not the ankle joint, it's uh, the subtalar. In one of the cases, we have to uh, reoperate the patient and we, we made a fusion, a fusion of the ankle joint and of the subtalar. In the rest, um, uh, 19, uh, 19 cases, no, 20 cases, we, we didn't fix, we didn't perform any other procedure. So I think, again, uh, this, uh, this series are sedentary, old patients uh, with a walking difficulty, low demand. So I think that's the, the key. That's the, that's the key the key for, for success. If you use this method in active patients, you, you will have a lot of problems because you are not, fu uh, you are not uh, fusing a, a joint and seeing, I think in these cases, it's better to, to make a, a formal fusion. But 
Uh, in most of the cases, the ankle na and the nail is, is very well tolerated and you don't need a fusion for, to get the good result. Then uh, another question is here, um, do you sometimes use exter external fixators, for example, the Ilirazov or Taylor frame, especially yeah, Shaco With cases? No. I think it's, a, it's another, in Shakot food, in Shakot cases, is another uh, uh, treatment. You have two options, of course. Uh, in my center, we don't have experience with a Taylor frame. I think it's very good. It's, I think I know it's a very good treatment for the shark coat. It's a very good, but I think it's, it's a matter of school. You know, in, in our center, we don't have the, the school. We don't have the, the background of, the, of using the Taylor frame. I have a lot of, of cases uh, treated in, in, other, in other centers with, uh, with Taylor frame. And with also good uh, good results, we prefer the intramedullary nails in our in our school. It's a matter of different ways of uh, of treatment. All right, perfect. Um, any further questions from the audience? So maybe give them another minute. Great. Otherwise, if there are no more questions, thank you so much, Mario. It was a really Thanks. nice, highly educational webinar from your side. Just for the audience, uh, this webinar will be available online by end of the week. And uh, you can find it on the Medatus website. And uh, yeah, the next uh, webinar is then taking place in about two weeks. And uh, the next topic, let me just have a look at that, is um, the next topic is ankle atrodesis with Alexei Bark, or Professor Alexei Bark from um, now living in Germany. He just moved from the US over and it's on the 23rd of June. Okay. Good, then we got, yeah, nice feedback, great presentation. Thanks a lot from all over the world, I guess. Okay, thanks to all the audience, and especially uh, thanks to, to you, Lucas, for your help and for also to Medartis and Professor Valderabano. See you very soon, I hope. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much and have a great okay. evening. Welcome. Same to you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.